plug this in and it'll go away. Okay. Yeah, I heard you say plug it in and go away. <laughs> 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 All right, we are up on uh, live stream and welcome to those of you who are watching this recording. Um, that echo in the background is Patricia's computer. Ignore it for a second. Um, we got, uh, I'll let you know exactly what time we begin our discussion. Usually there are some preliminaries. It doesn't take long, probably five at the most 10 minutes. Um, hopefully shorter than that. I'd like to go ahead and get started with the discussion. This is a discussion that we've been on for like, I don't know, we've been on this discu discussion for about uh, three weeks now. Greetings, everybody. Hey, Kia. Yeah. Hi, Kia. Hello, Kia. All right, we're, we're live and um, I don't know if anybody heard it because I forgot to press a button, but It's probably me that forgot this time. Hang on. Yep. All right, I'm up. I'm tired, I didn't get enough sleep. So I'm, I'm fixing it all though. I have a fresca and I'm sitting on the Mediterranean. <laughs> it looks good too. It was a stormy day that day. I took that shot at Caesarea Maritima. Nice. Yeah, it was a dark sky, big waves. Yeah. Green, for blue green water. It was just lovely. You don't have to touch up a picture that good. That's right. So. Um, Jean, uh, share with us a little bit about your group this morning. And um, you, you know, we, you know, sometimes you get over a hundred views. And then uh, this morning you made a swap. What, what, what exactly did you do? Did you ask your people to come down to the church and some of them to meet with you live? Yeah, we started that now. Coming back to have Sunday school classes on a class on Sunday, <clears throat> and I invited them to start in uh, May if they feel comfortable to come into the little conference room, the, the same one that we used when you and Patricia came and visited. Uh, that way we could spread out a little bit. And <clears throat> supposedly I have the technology in there that I need to do the meeting. Apparently uh, the operator was incapable of operating the technology, <clears throat> but I'm working on that. But we had uh, one person who's been with us from the beginning of our studies here in Lafayette, uh, Gerald, and then two people who for the first time ever came to a small group at the church, uh, wow. participated in the conversation, uh, loved, and, and they stayed around and talked for 30 more minutes when we went offline. That's very encouraging after very such a frustrating morning. But we have a number of other people uh, that would have been here, but they had a conflict either with a doctor's appointment or a family trip or a graduation or something. I, I really believe that that's going to pick up with the in-person component and with a little bit of technology help uh, they'll be able to participate live around the conference table with us on Zoom and, and Facebook. Well, that should be interesting. That's a big change. Um, so dynamic. I wonder, yeah, it does. I mean, I'm not sure what my role will be in that. I'm like, I'm like I, I, do, I get to talk to them and get to hear them. And usually it's just yeah. Ron. Yeah. And Ron will step in every once in a while. And a VFW event today to participate in. Oh, I see. So I, I expect it will double next week. Okay. Well, we'll just, you want to just wing it? Yeah. That's what I do most days. <laughs> well, all right. Well, and by the way, um, with, the, with the spume behind you of the wave at the jetty, mm -hmm. you look like Einstein. That's right. <laughs> The intellect just pours forth. There it is. That was it. Right? <laughs> there we go. There you go. I know it's all. I know it's all relative, but you really do. I like this. 
<laughs> that's good. Love you, brother. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, uh, you know, I know they have big waves at a place called, it's on the coast of Portugal. They have like 100 plus foot waves that those crazy people are riding on surfboards. Um, and it was nothing like that, but it was, I mean, it was rough enough that it was shooting spray into the air 50 feet. And mm -hmm. it was pretty impressive. This is a harbor that Har Harry the Great built. Very little of it's left, but some of it out there and a little underwater. It got tore up. Okay. Um, so my memory is, is that that chart was really helpful that we used last week. Am I wrong? It was helpful. Do we need to see it again before we continue? It might be. We may get the questions again. It might help. Uh, okay, well, let me, let me shoot it up. I'm trying. It's like I forgot how because I'm asleep. I'm almost ran up the road trying to get her and I was so sleepy. Really? You almost ran up the road? Oh, by the way, how well are you hearing Patricia right now? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. She's nice and strong? Yes. Okay. At least on my phone. Great. <laughs> I can't see her. You can't see me? I have my camera on. No, but I'm on my phone. And so I think I'm just ah. seeing, I think I'm just seeing whoever's the main talker. Yeah, and I think I think they filter things off. You know, they filter some people off, and I don't know what their algorithm is. And but yeah, when you talk, usually yeah. it'll come back on. But um whatever. that's because you have it spotlighted. If you click on right click, it might come and show more pictures. More, more faces. Let's see. Hmm. Wow, it really is not going well technology-wise for me either, Gene. I, I, I'm, I'm looking at a, every week I pull things up. I pulled this thing up last week. It's still where I left it last week. And I, and I swear I cannot find the place. I can't find my desktop. I can't find my desktop. It doesn't make any sense. I did it on my phone this morning. At one point, it was like an infinite number of screens. And I couldn't <laughs> make it stop. I felt like I was in a house of mirrors. And oh, by the way, <clears throat> may the fourth be with you. You know, thank you. I'm <laughs> happy fourth to you too. Uh, wow. There's nothing I can do. My, it's okay. my laptop, my, my, my desktop, my files, they're not... They're not in the share box. I, I mean, I can't, I can't even get to my desktop. All right, so um, that means that I probably can't share with you the materials that I presented for tonight either. This is so bizarre, Gene. Uh, who jinxed us today? The force is not strong with us today. <laughs> No, the fourth. <laughs> the fourth is not long. The fourth. If Darth Vader had a lift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's been a long day. Is it open on your desktop? Yeah, it's right on my desktop, but I can't find my desktop. I can't find any of my files. It's funny, Bert, your microphone is making a dent in your right shoulder, at least the way it looks on my phone. Oh, it's, it's possible. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm more concerned about the sound than I am about what it looks like. I, I didn't plan yeah. that background. I was, someone told me how to do it and I didn't mean to set it up like that, but. <laughs> I see videos, I see audios, I see, I mean, there are categories here, but none of them are my computer. Mm. Oh, that's my stuff for tonight. Okay, so I can, I can show them that. Okay. Well, let's do that. Yeah, I've got some stuff on here that's worth looking at, I think. Here comes Sheila. Ah. Uh. I see it now, but it's hard to read. I may need to get my glasses. I can make it bigger. How how big is it on your screen? Well, I can definitely make it bigger. That's better. Hang on, I'm working on it. <sighs> Oh, well, there's the chart. It was actually in my document. Okay. How many of you can see the chart? Hey, Sheila, welcome. Hey, thank you. So can you see the chart? Chart's up. I can see it. Cool. Now, what is this orange thing right here? It's coming with a black box on the Yeah, it looks like a black box. To yeah. Us. I'm trying. It says, please move this window away from a shared application. No, I, I would I would delete it if I could. Because you got a long black one right here on the side, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the black one on the side is where y'all's faces are. Okay. Uh, okay. Check your view, too. No, this, yeah. yeah, that's my, that's that. No, yes, this. it's that. Thing, yeah. yeah um so i don't i don't know what this thing is I, i've never seen it before and i'm clicking left right and it won't, it won't go away okay so let me try something i'm going to copy this and just put it on another sheet and that way maybe you all can see um It's still there. That is so strange. Can you? But you can see the chart, right? No, the screen is black now. The screen is black now. Oh, it's not mine is. Okay, it's It says, please move this window away from the shared application. Does that mean they do not want me to look at the chart with you? <laughs> Are they telling me? Okay. Oh, now I see it. Sure. Yep, yeah. yeah, we got it. So yeah. this thing down here, I think is there to annoy us because we must be using someone's intellectual property, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. No, I can't, I can't select it. It will not give me the option to select it. And I've never received a message like that before. And I think it's Facebook. Hmm. I'm only seeing it on Zoom, so I don't. What does it mean to move this window away from the shared application? And, and how, if it wants me to move it, how come I can't select it or move it? I'd be glad to move it, but on you Zoom. can't. Your desktop, do you have the option to minimize some things? Yeah. Try that. Because it may be picking it up off your desktop. Well, it went away with something. Do as I do, do as I say, because I screwed up this morning. Yeah. Well. says my screen sharing is paused. I don't even know why. Okay, what do I do now? You still have it up on the screen. Just let's go back to the um, chart. 
Okay, I'm reopening it. Tell me if you can see this. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so we really we we really got light. Let's do this. All right. So from last week, you recall the chart we discussed. Uh, every one of us has had some sort of religious indoctrination, and as you can see, the blue circle is sort of the uh, outer wall. You know, mm -hmm. it's the barricade. It's to keep certain people out, certain ideas out, and um, that whenever you have indoctrination, the most important thing you can do is control the information that comes in and out and, and to repress the critical thinking of the person on the inside. Um, you identify things like sex, science, politics, history, culture, and psychology is bad. Um, you uh, preach a message of God's judgment, damnation, fear, end times, the devil, that you're uh, a dirty, guilty, shameful person, and yet you, you have instilled in you a fantasy ideal that our church is perfect. We're the only ones who know the way. It's paradoxical, given that everybody inside is desperately guilty and shamed and abused. Uh, on the other side of it, they also use punishment on children and adults. They also isolate children and adults. But it's important to isolate. I've talked to people who have been um, scammed by, by con men or con women. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing um, that made them successful was they were able to keep my friend or family member from actually calling and checking with anybody. They had techniques to isolate you. Yeah. No, we're not. We can't go down there, ma'am. Or um, no, now if you use the phone right now, I'm going to have to report you. So if they can keep you in the box, yeah. they can exploit you and get your money or whatever it is they want. Um, yeah, and so you have at the bottom emotional, intellectual, sexual, and social uh, developmental delays. And Kia made uh, the best comment last week about the fact that this is cult-like. And it is. It's not a full-blown cult. There are two other elements that we talked about. One is uh, a hyper-charismatic leader who controls everyone's money and everyone's sex. You know? And there is the uh, other element is that most people in, in churches like the ones we went to and like yours growing up, didn't require everybody to live there like on a compound and turn in all their goods. But short of that, this has cult-like qualities, the control the and the abuse and the manipulation um, and the exploitation, especially of children, which is atrocious, just atrocious. So uh, uh, I was thinking about Sheila and I, I was going to start with feelings, but I, I think I want to start with intellectual rewiring. Can you all see that? Yes. So what I want to try to get at, Sheila, and for the rest of you as well, is um, you've been in your process that you've talked about so honestly. Um, notice number one says learn how to think critically. Two says reduce dependence upon others for decision making. And three, recognize and develop resistance to attempts to control what you think and do. Um, so the question for the group is, is when did that happen for you and how did it happen for you and what helped? How did you start to rewire? How did you begin to think critically about religious matters and the behavior of this, that you were seeing at the church? Um, and how did you learn to stop? feeling guilty for asking people for permission to date somebody or something like that. I, as far as asking about the permission, that's something I never did. I never asked permission to do anything, but um, it took me a while when I started going to uh, Spring City Methodist it took me a while, first of all, to trust everybody. It took me a while to trust the pastor. Um, 
So one day I was sitting there and I realized maybe if I took some Bible studies where I actually opened the Bible with other people and started listening to them, and maybe then I could see the light, I guess you might want to call it. Um, and I did. I started feeling a little more at ease. I didn't ask many questions because I thought I was stupid. I mean, here I am when I first start Bible study at 58 years old. I don't know anything really other than what I was taught when I was little, knowing the ark and um, Adam and Eve and little things like that. But as I went on. And Brer Rabbit. And Brer Rabbit, actually, yes. <laughs> and I love that. That was so cute. Yeah, that's, that's in first condemnation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as time went on, I started gaining a little bit more trust in the religion, uh, Christianity. I realized that how I actually was without going to church was actually the way I was supposed to be. I mean, I was loving. No, wait, say that again. The way you were. The way I was is the way I was supposed to be. Yes. I was, I was loving. I was caring. I did for others. Um, but I didn't realize when I was doing that, that that's the way I'm supposed to be. I thought I was different. Yeah. I really did. I thought I was different. But as time went on and I started going more and more and more, I realized that I'm no different really than anybody else in that room. Everybody had to learn. You know, maybe some had a, you know, an easy childhood and, and they learned young. But do you still have all the answers? No, no. And I never will have all the answers. But what I do know now, I do love God. He's with me day and night. I pray day and night. Uh, I'm still helping people. I'm still loving people. I'm a very caring person. So. It's funny how some people will uh, accuse you of being the opposite of what you are. Really? Like if you're a generous person, they'll find a way to accuse you of being cheap. Exactly. Or if oh, you're yeah. an honest person, they'll call you a liar. Exactly. Hey, I've been called um, a lot of things by my sisters because they say that, you know, I'm a phony. Uh, and I just tell them, painful. no, I'm not. I said, I said, was Jesus a phony? And they just look at me. And I said, well, I'll tell you, no, he wasn't. So, no, I'm not. I mean, what do they think you're doing every Sunday and Wednesday doing all this stuff? You're not proving anything to them or to anybody else. I mean, what... What evidence is there that you're doing this to prove something to someone? What do you have to gain by coming here and doing this? You don't have anything to gain. We don't pay you. No. You know? No. You no, know, and your um, salvation isn't dependent upon it. So God isn't going to kill you if you don't show up. So right, I mean, well, you're here, if you're here I'll because you want to be every single exactly. time almost, at what point does logic break down that says, Oh, well, she didn't. She's just doing that for show. Well, I'll tell you, I joke. I have fun. Um, I'm still the sister that they grew up with. I crack jokes. I have a good time. I'll ride a motorcycle, ride along with them, and well, then why do I'll they do have a all the things I've ever done. Why do they have a problem with your faith? Because they think that. Because I do all these other things, then how can I be a Christian and go to church every okay, Sunday? So, so they're confused. Yes. They very think much to be so. a Christian, you have to stop being yourself. Yep. Mm -hmm. So tell them yep. they're wrong. You don't know when you become a Christian, you become you are allowed to be fully yourself. I'm free. Leave me alone. Exactly. So they, <laughs> you got it backwards. You're confused. Uh, that's what I try to tell them. But I, you know, again. 
they're my sisters and <laughs> we just uh, let it go. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that may yeah. reveal that, that, that the way they, their perception of church and all that, that may reveal that they do, would not feel free to be themselves in that environment. So they assume maybe the same for everybody else. Yeah, that's the truth. That's the, exactly. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for them. I really do. Because I have a little more excitement in my life now than I did before. Yeah. You know, you can go and you can do enduros and you can race on ice and you can do every, all of that. Mm -hmm. But this is more exciting. It really is. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. Sheila, Look, look at my emotional reawakening questions. I specifically asked you the ones about rewiring your brain. And the very first one under my emotional reawakening is learning to be self-reflective and who I am. You, you completely bypassed the brain question and went straight to your heart. And, I'm, and so we're just going to follow your lead. How about that? Hey, right. I can go all night if you want me to. <laughs> okay, so if anybody needs to talk about the brain, we'll get there in a minute, I guess, or you can talk about it now. But she's she's been. I mean, look look at these emotional reawakening things that I wrote down. Um, where where did you learn to be self reflective? When did you begin to see who I am and become more okay with yourself? Because the whole thing about religious indoctrination, Patricia, is that they they're going to do everything they can to tell you you aren't all right like you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's part of the way that they control you. Mm -hmm. So uh, number two is recognize and legitimize one's own feelings. Well, you, you should be ashamed for feeling that. You don't have a right to feel that. Besides, feeling, feelings a lot to you. They say things like that. Mm -hmm. This is not about your feelings. And um, so, it, you know, people have feelings. Have you noticed when people cry, they say, I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. Right. Like there's mm -hmm. something wrong with mm -hmm. feelings well mm -hmm. your feelings just are you know yeah. and number three identify points of emotional woundedness and need of healing so those are those are good and and um of course emotional points of healing for sheila as she's brought up one is family we all have wounds in our families mm -hmm. yeah. and um and they they are often connected to our family's re uh, relationship and long-term participation in religious organizations that may or may not may have been healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Who's got who's got something to share about um, awakening um, cognitively or reawakening emotionally after reflecting on uh, your upbringing and your indoctrination? Because we got some good folks sitting right there who can who can do it. Well, I'll jump in. Um, so, I mean, when you, the word rewiring really uh, resonates with me. I remember your paper. Yeah, it's just a part of my psychological theory around the brain rewiring and um, what's his name? Uh, I studied with, with. Anyway. I mean, the um, weird thing is they proved that when someone changed, they, would, they, they can take pictures of the brain. And when someone changed, the brain reshaped its own structure yeah. to accommodate the decision. Yeah. But it happens. That, no, it's over crazy, time, right? It, it, yeah. it doesn't happen overnight. And, and which tells us, too, that hearing something new for the first time, it doesn't mean that you will change right away or the yeah. next day or the next week. It's like, um, time after time after time hearing the same thing and asking provoking questions and ref being reflective um, and getting answers to your questions and make and reasoning for your one's own self reflecting on well why do I do that but well, this doesn't make sense because I've been hearing this all of my life or everybody else is doing it so this is not making sense so just being reflective and um, with one's own self and thinking for yourself, thinking critically and asking yourselves those critical questions and asking yeah. others, those, others those critical questions makes a whole lot of difference. 
the word reflection, Patricia, I mean, maybe we should just remind folks that we're not just talking about sitting around thinking about God. What we're talking about here is in relationships, we're, we're mo many of us, all of us are reactive to a certain degree in our situations. We're defensive and we're suspicious and we're reactive. Mm -hmm. And um, we can't get curious. You, you can't be curious when you're defensive and anxious, yeah. you know? So um, what self-reflection uh, has to do with and being reflective has to do with is stopping being defensive for a moment and blaming somebody else or some circumstances and Op open up and let people help you see what you're doing. What, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. The um, reflection is sort of like putting uh, in, in CPE, it's like somebody reacts to something that someone says, and then the supervisor might say, well, let's pause here and let's reflect on what's going on and see this systemically or whatever direction from which Patricia wants to look at it. So if you're reactive all the time, you're not, you can't reflect. You have to stop reacting and stop being defensive in order to reflect. Hey, and Bert, it's not easy to do. You saw my post um, the other day um, where I reflected about myself. Yeah. Where it started out that I hated this person and, and I went down. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's what people got to do. They got to sit back and, and actually tell the truth about themselves. And I did. I hated myself. Yeah, I don't like myself sometimes too, Shu. I get tired of my weaknesses. I get tired yep. of making the same mistakes. I, you know, um, who is it that said, I just need a vacation from me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you do that with a coma <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah pretty much <laughs> um uh, other others gino what's up with you man one of the one of the word buzzwords that we learned at st paul was the word practice which describes what you just which i guess summarizes what you just described about action and reflection that there's got to be a yin yang a balance to that. That if you don't ever, if you don't ever reflect on something, you're always just a reactionary. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of our people and a lot of our churches, for better or for worse, are are reactionary theologians. They're not reflective. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you know, we're always praying and asking God for something. How many times have you had someone say, "I sat around and waited for what God had to say." <laughs> well, I've said that. <laughs> yeah, I I think I need to hear more about this. Uh, what what? Explain how this works. Well, I mean, kind of like what you're talking about, what we all did when we did CPE. You know, you you, you hear a, a report, you hear a, a verbatim, you hear a story, then you ask those questions that we've learned. Dread. How do you feel about that? What does that make you think about? Where, where in the Bible does it, is there a story that resonates with it? What do you think Jesus would have you do about this now? Or, you know, because of this story that you just heard, what are you going to do differently? How are you going to respond differently to people or ministerial situations or crisis? <clears throat> um, and, and, of course, one of our first responses always as the no knowledgeable people is to have an answer. Um, one of the people leaving today had a situation with a friend of, of a lifelong friend who's just been diagnosed with an operable brain cancer. The friend um, has chosen not to do chemo, not to do radiation, but to be as graceful in their demise as they can be. And the qu person's question for me was, what do I say when I talk to them? And yeah. my, my response was, I don't know. But Job's friends outlived their usefulness when they quit sitting in solidarity and they started offering cheap advice. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, I think, boy, it really gets complicated what to say to people when someone dies, what to say to someone when they get sick, when they, what to say to someone 
when they uh, have to go into rehab, what they have to say to someone if they end up in jail. Uh, it's, it's hard to know what the right thing to say is. And, and I talked about that a little bit in my sermon on Sunday, but it seems to me that, that as bad as we are doing this, we might want to sit down and reflect on what it is we would need in a situation or want in a situation like that. Not that it, not that everybody's alike, mm -hmm. um, but uh, so yeah, what do you need in a situation like that? But also finding a way to ask the person, what do you need? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not a stupid question. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you're supposed to come up with the answer that's going to make the person feel better and you can leave feeling like a good Christian. Hey, okay, well, how about asking them what they what they really need from you? Yeah. And that, that risks them saying, I don't need anything. I just need to be alone. It's not mm -hmm. personal, but can you come back on Wednesday? Mm -hmm. um, and if you can handle that kind of a, a straight conversation, I mean, pe people who are ill like that or in a crisis, they're likely to shoot pretty straight with you if mm -hmm. you're close to them. And, then, and and you and you and also you can say please don't let me overstay my welcome and please don't let me leave if you want me to stay mm -hmm. you know yeah asking for what you need mm -hmm. but yeah. Je jesus did a good job with peter i talked about it on sunday you know he peter had uh hit bottom i mean it couldn't be any worse for him and how is jesus going to help him yeah. he actually helped him and um the yeah. brilliance of the scripture, you know, mm. giving us giving us the means whereby to over sort of overhear and uh, uh, spy on what it is that Jesus to try to help Peter out of that situation. Well, not out of it, but through it, you know. But you know, mm -hmm. Peter quit after he denied Jesus, and yeah. I don't blame him. Who 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 wouldn't have? It, just just a horrible horrible situation, but. We need people like Peter who Jesus found a way to help forgive himself yeah. and move forward. Tell the women and Peter. Tell my disciples. Tell my, go Peter. tell my disciples and Peter yeah. that uh, I've risen. Yeah. He's not a cast away. No, no, he quit. Mm -hmm. But he may have been the one that brought them back together into one room. As I said on Sunday, mm -hmm. he may have been the one to bring them back together because he's the one that they, he appeared to, G, to Peter alone. Yeah. And, and then suddenly they're in one room together. How do you explain that? Well, Peter probably went and found them and said, he's actually risen. But what if Peter wanted to go find the disciples? No. Something dramatic had to help him happen mm -hmm. for him to go search and get them all together and join them. And that's something dramatic was the fact that Jesus walked up to Peter and said, hey, we need to talk. Yeah. We have Talked no idea. A, a reawakening, you know. Reawakening, yeah. 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 And Peter had time to just to self-reflect. Who am I? Well, I don't know. I think you Peter know? was just in, sh <laughs> in shock and, and, and outrageously angry with himself for his cowardice. Who knows what would have happened if he'd said, yeah, I know him. I mean, then they still might not have killed him because he wasn't fighting anybody. Well, he did swing the sword in the garden. Maybe he could have gotten trumped up on something, but. Mm -hmm. oh, what are you thinking, Mike? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about that, uh, you know, the perspective of someone, uh, depending on so many factors of what's going on, like we're talking about now, you know, how it's so different when you trust the people that you're talking to, you know, uh, that, that kind of helps uh, affect how you're thinking. Uh, you know, if you're with trusting people, who also you trust them, they trust you, then your perspective can broaden and you can go from looking at it from the way you may normally to, you know, kind of looking at it from above and getting a new perspective. And all of a sudden you get an aha moment. Oh, I, I didn't realize that. 
and yeah, that's good. You know, and I think that happens in these conversations on, on, on this, that, you know, you're looking at several different aspects of what's happening and you see how these things can happen. And, you know, you, you actually uh, are broadening yourself and who you are as you relate to people and, and talk through what's happening. Well, uh, the serendipity of this place Becoming a safe enough space for people to do this is something that I think about all the time. Um, uh -huh. It's really unusual, and it's uh, in, num in a number of ways. One of the ways that it's unusual is that lay people and pastors are talking to one another like people. You know, because we've got Patricia and me and Jean and Dale, and um, who are or normally here, and all of us are ordained. And yet it's hard, it would it'd be hard to tell from watching a recording if you didn't know all of us, which ones were the pastors mm -hmm. in the group. Maybe they picked me out because I lead, but mm -hmm. that would not necessarily be true, but probably true. But um, that the collegiality, the, the lack, um, uh, you know, you look at Gene or you look at Dale or Patricia and you don't see someone trying to prove that they're the, the spiritually, the most spiritual person in the room, which is what church clergy often try to do, especially if they're on the radio or the internet. They've come with something to prove and to sell. And um, that's what religion does. And they're indoctrinated and don't know it. That's how indoctrination functions. It gets you and it starts making you work for it. Right. And, and you don't even know why. Yeah. But I think Mike said something key to birth uh, when that? he used the word trust. Yes. You know, you call it a safe space. And uh, I think that's really key because if people are not as, you know, comfortable to ask questions, you know, I mean, Sheila said something um, that hurt my heart when and earlier that she thought she was stupid. And it's like that people make you feel that way. You know, because mm -hmm. you're asking questions, if you don't know and you're really trying to know, that's not a safe environment. That's not a safe space. How can you trust when someone's making you feel that little? And so I think having an environment of safety and trusting others, you can ask all the silly, the silliest questions. They're, you know, it's okay to do that because you want answers. And um, yeah, so... So where, where else do you all, other than here, do you all have other places where you have safe enough space to reflect and be yourself? Any, any of you? Mm, that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a hard question. It's like, <laughs> there's so little spaces, if any, I mean, you know what I mean, to, to I be really, yourself. And I really am meaning where. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, um, 10, 20 years ago, when psychologists and, and counselors were saying things like, they weren't saying, when do you feel anxious? They started saying, where? Mm -hmm. Because that's the lesson. That's mm -hmm. the learning. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like Peter, Peter got anxious when he smelled that charcoal fire. And there was a reason. He was standing over a charcoal mm -hmm. fire when he betrayed Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus builds a charcoal fire on the beach to rehabilitate him. And asked him if he, he denies he knew him three times. And at the next charcoal fire, he uh, says that he loves him three times. So, um, and the, these, uh, what, where we, um, get me back on track. I'm tired. Where, do you, where you feel safe? Other places where you, you feel, feel safe. where you feel safe. Yeah. I mean, somehow, somehow Peter felt safe enough on that beach mm -hmm. because Jesus was fixing food charcoal fire invited him to reflect on a painful moment of his life he was courageous enough to do that because the space was safe enough and he knew that jesus was not there to beat him up and judge him yeah. i feel safe i think with my cpe community whenever i'm around other um cp educators and we have conferences i feel really that i could be myself and not look around and not worry about anything or anybody that's an environment where I really feel safe, but there's not a whole lot of places that I do. 
Anybody else? Um, have you got any place else other than here where you can kind of be yourself and uh, and not be uh, so guarded? I'm myself now every day. <laughs> Just let her rip, huh? That, that's the only way to be. <laughs> Good for you. Oh, Lord. It is. I mean, um, even in church, this new church, I mean, I'm who I am. And you either got to love me or hate me, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> I hate you, Sheila. <laughs> What about you, Kia? You've been quiet. <laughs> Any of this resonating with you, Kia? Are you out there? I'm here. I was just thinking about the self-reflection piece in that for some people, self-reflection may be difficult because that means you have to be your own worst critic and you don't want to hear what you have to say about you. And it's easier if you deflect and point out the bad about others because that makes you forget about the bad about yourself. Yeah. And, and people don't want to know themselves. I mean, to know oneself is to claim oneself and who wants to do that? Because that means the good, the bad, and all of your ugly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the John 3 thing that, you know, um, that the light came into the world, not to judge the world, but, but it ended up being judgment because the light exposed everyone and their deeds. Yeah. And so you have some people who liked the exposure and some who and moved toward it mm -hmm. and others who uh, hated it and moved away from it. And mm -hmm. it says people, there was, there were people who hated the light Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sheila used the word stupid. Kia used the word bad. Yeah. Action and reflection, the praxis kind of model. It's it is never. It, let me back up. It should never be the purpose to tell you you're bad. Right. It should help you find a more excellent way of being. Mm -hmm. the bubble is going to tell you you're bad and you're a sinner uh, when they talked to me after church Sunday she said it's the first time she's been to church for two months straight first time in her life of going to a church that she doesn't feel like that from the minute she walks in the door until the minute she walks out she's told over and over again you're bad God, mm. God's going to send you to a bad place yeah, I, I'm fully aware too, Gene, that there are pastors out there whose heads pop off the pillow every morning thinking of how can I hurt my congregation better on Sunday? Well, and they're hurting too, and they don't even know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but for me, you know, Bert, Bert and I were a part of a group that met for good gosh, 25 years. Uh, one of those same places was always uh, sessions of Rebecca's farm. Well, Becky and I decided our place was going to be like that when we established it. Yeah. But I'm not, to be honest, I'm not really much different when I'm on the farm riding a horse than I am sitting, standing in the pulpit. And I'm not, I am bound and determined not to be a different person between those two places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for you, Jane. Yeah. Awesome. We got a lot of Christians. I mean, who just switch? I mean, I, 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 I could switch on you. You would not believe. I mean, <laughs> when you see me in the pulpit, oh, I'm totally different when I come out because you know. Anyway, I won't. I won't get in all that. But, <laughs> 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 but yeah, we can switch it up. You know, we can switch it up. No, now that's that's my past. Um, what you see is what you get right now. I'm, you know, I try to be the same everywhere I go. It doesn't matter what environment, who I am. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to have a good time. Yeah, there's a time to be serious, and I think there's a time for everything, but I'm going to be myself, who I am. I can be my best self. Um, I, I don't know how to be fraudulent. It's like, I mean, you know, I, 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 can, I can practice that, and I've done that, you know, some years of my life, but now where I am, you know, I think I told Bert the other day, I don't have time. It takes too much energy to be fake and to perform. I don't have that kind of time at this stage in my life, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. 
yeah, that's just, it's just got to go. Yeah. Well, uh, well what about the, are these questions right here helpful? Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like that's what you're talking about, right? I mean, do you feel pressured and confined every Sunday? Or do you feel encouraged and liberated by worship? The latter. Yeah. And so, but there, and, and, but we've heard from Gene too that there, he knows people who answer me either way. You know, that for a lot of their lives, you know, they felt pressured and confined mm -hmm. and trapped and punished mm -hmm. and didn't know that that wasn't normal. Yeah. How do you get to knowing that that's not normal is one of the questions that... You don't. You think that is normal. But eventually, if you become unindoctrinated, yeah. it, it, it occurs to you somehow. Mm -hmm. I'm curious yeah. how that happens. Yeah. And for you, it was risking coming to the United States and risking going to CPE. I think that was a, the two big things, you know? And taking a risk getting to know you. And getting a risk to <laughs> know Which me. I was like, oh, I'm going to show about this. Uh, <laughs> she, I don't think she was following, I, um, following me around like a puppy. That is not true. <laughs> I, uh, she was, you know, like. I couldn't get her. I couldn't shake her off. <laughs> <laughs> where it says, you know, fear not. Away. And you're not getting it. I'm a terrible liar. <laughs> Mike can tell the story. He knows the truth. <laughs> oh, Lord, sorry, he was trying to say something. <laughs> Overall, is the message of your congregation and your worship and your pastor, fear not or be afraid? That's the one I was taught was trying to tell yeah. you about. Um, yeah. I used to be a, you know, all the messages were were fear, were fear, be yeah. afraid. Um, I have to tell you, in in order for you to really understand my church going, first of all, when I was born, my mother didn't want me. Second of all, she ended up keeping me and the man that uh, she married adopted me and he was Catholic. He was a very, very fine man, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but she used to call me um, Satan's spawn. Mm. She, she didn't she didn't like me one iota. Satan spawn. Well, mm. anyway. As, that, as time went that's, on. It's not exactly an affectionate term, is it? Is it? Yeah. As Jeez. time went on, yeah. I had to, you know, go to church and I was scared to death because I knew that, you know, from listening that God didn't like Satan mm. and he sure didn't mm. want me in that church. Oh, wow. Mm. I mean, that's, that was my fear for the longest time, mm. longest time. Yeah. So my this grandmother took me to her church, which is the Methodist church. Mm. And they told me there was no way I could be Satan's pawn. Yeah. That that was something in my mother's head. And that, you know, not to not to dwell on that. That so you I, shifted, you would have had to have shifted at some point cognitively between something's wrong with me and maybe there's something wrong with my mother. Well, I did shift later. Mm -hmm. I did shift later. Um, there was something very wrong with my mother. She um, she had a lot of problems. Alcohol mm -hmm. was one of them. That'll do it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then again, now I was in Catholic school and I was left-handed. And even the sister told me I was Satan's spawn because Satan was left-handed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did they that know that? <laughs> I heard that before. And we used to tease my younger sister, Renee, who was on last week. She's the only one left-handed. And we would tease her. That was so mean. Now that I think about it, when she was a yeah. child, she owed, and we would say, you owe the devil something. I don't know where yeah. we got that nonsense. I don't know. But I mean, so you you figure mm -hmm. a parent's telling you you're Satan spawn. And then, you know, a, 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 mm. a sister of a, of a, a religion. You know, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be of Christianity. It's telling you you're Satan's spawn. Mm -hmm. It was scary. I'm sorry you had to go through that, Sheila, and hear mm -hmm. that. That's terrible. No, you terrible. know what? 
I'm not sorry that I had to go through it. It made me a bigger and better person and it made me want to know more about God. Absolutely. And now that I do, you know, I'm thinking of what I missed, what I missed out of for so long. Yeah. But I'm happy go lucky today because I know I ain't Satan spawn. <laughs> and obviously your mother also lived in a an environment of fear to yeah. be that way. Mm -hmm. And I don't you know. know where that would come from because my grandmother was not like that. Her mother, she was yeah. not like that. So I don't know where that came from. Came we from really somewhere. Don't. Mm -hmm. let's, yeah. talk, let's talk about um, resentment and I'll give you an example from me. Um, uh, my, my point of healing and woundedness around the evangelical bubble this whole thing we've been looking about in terms of indoctrination. Um, my biggest, my biggest wounds were around. I just hated those people. I hated Pentecostals and Baptists. I thought that they were self-righteous, cruel, horrible human beings, and they had no idea what was in the Bible and they had no idea who Jesus was. And um, as I grew older and uh, in high school, it just got worse because of the way they treated me. They, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that the, you know, the president of the youth organization at a Baptist church can be the worst bully of my life. Mm -hmm. And I can watch a, a Christian girl look a Jewish girl in the face and tell her she's going to hell and smile. And this is what we, uh, that's what I was faced with. And I haven't gotten over it. I, it's hard to get over bullies. It's hard to get over uh, that kind of evangelical ugliness. Yeah. And, um, and yet, if you think about it, you know, almost all of, of my friends have some sort of evangelical um, um, flavor to them. You and, and many others that I'm close to. Um, and I think part of that is because I know I think I know when I meet someone who really loves Jesus and when, and when I'm meeting something, someone who is going through the motions of just being religious. Mm -hmm. And, 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 I'm, and I've always been hungry for people who felt the same way about Jesus that I did. Mm -hmm. And they're hard to find. Yeah. They're more <laughs> likely to be found in an evangelical congregation. On the other hand, look at all the baggage that comes from being in one of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look how much work we had to do to, you know, to understand one another. I understood your heart. You understood mine. When I told you I love Jesus, you totally believed me. Yeah. But it didn't line up. I'm like, how did someone love Jesus so much? But he's not doing what the scripture says, according to my Bible. <laughs> and I'm like, no, oh, no, this, say, this doesn't seem to line up. But you mean like it's Jesus. not? It's not okay to smoke an occasional cigar. It's not okay to have uh, wine with dinner. I don't drink wine, but that's just an yes. example. Yes. And wine gives me migraines. But um, yeah. so, so, yeah. but your, your congregation didn't, pre, didn't give you the message that there was such a thing as freedom in Christ? Oh, no. Yeah, but that, not that kind of freedom. That wasn't freedom. That was just you on your way to Christless hell. Christless hell. You, you did hell. this, that, that. We had categories, you know? With, yeah, but here again, when you say a Christless hell, I know that's I know that's just a cliche, but you know the scriptures are pretty clear about that everything exists in and by and for and through and uh, through Jesus. So exactly where isn't he? Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. People don't yeah, but think. I, mean, I, but I didn't understand grace that the way I understood it, understand it today. It just wasn't. I, it just, no, it just wasn't it was not a part, part of theology. Yeah. No, but it's no, no. where it's where the scriptures begin. Yeah. Because that's the good news mm -hmm. is, is the grace of God in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. who forgives us of our sins and takes them away. Yeah. When we could not find a way to be good enough mm -hmm. through following the rules, yeah. the religious rules, the laws, mm -hmm. the commandments, whatever you want to call them. And we found ourselves imprisoned by our own disobedience. Mm -hmm. And um, that's exactly what Paul called it. We were imprisoned by our own disobedience to the law because we couldn't do the good that we wanted to do and ended up doing the bad thing we knew we had, couldn't do, shouldn't right. do, wouldn't do. And this, this brokenness 
you know, is the human condition. And yet in these bubbles, I saw my friends talking and acting and almost strutting and preening about how we have the best church. We have the best pastor. And, you know, if you're going over there, you're not really getting the, the whole Jesus thing, the whole gospel thing. And, and their attitude was bizarre to me. And I, and I wondered how come they, how come they always wanted to go around changing everybody? Like they had the right to do that. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. What, what, why are you going to get saved anyway and go to church if it's not to win souls? You know what I mean? So it's like, that's the goal. Well, yeah, but to what's get your, everybody what's, saved. Has anybody got a good track record in trying to change anybody? I, I have a hard time changing me. Can yes. you make somebody do something? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you put enough fear in them. Yeah, so that's it. You put enough fear, they will. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So you just do, you do, you do what I say. Fear work. Yeah, fear work, and especially you got a scripture to go with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I, and it's the opposite of faith, mm -hmm. and it's what you pastors are choosing to use. They're choosing to use fear mm -hmm. instead of its opposite faith, and you can't produce faith via fear. You know, the whole idea is to scare people to God. Well, you know, it's like that. Why would why would you want to? I mean, it's like trying to scare someone to a Rottweiler that's going to chew you up. Mm -hmm. Why would I even want to go near a Rottweiler? Are you scare me to go to a Rottweiler, really? Yeah, you should really be afraid of that Walt Rottweiler. Now go over there. Well, yep. you should really be afraid of God, but you got to go to God. Yep. So, Bert, I've got a make sense. Fire, but I've, I've got a Sessions Pope story for you. Oh, Lord have Jesus. Um, <laughs> there was this church of a, a Baptist persuasion that fired their preacher because he wouldn't preach hellfire and damnation. So they hired a new preacher, and he preached it every week. And they fired him. And when he asked for an exit interview, he says, why are you firing me when what you wanted was someone to preach hellfire and damnation? And he said, well, our other preacher wouldn't preach it at all. And you preach it all the time. He says, but that's what you wanted. They said, yeah, but when you say it, you look like you look forward to us going there. <laughs> you look forward to us going there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's, uh, it's, amazing. Yeah. it's amazing to me how many pastors I've run into who are really, 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 oh, they, they hate church people. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they're going to punish them. I mean, they're going to play like, they're going to play the dad with the bad children. And they are going to whoop them, <laughs> whoop them, whoop them, whoop you them know, until they straighten up. Yep. I'm serious. They, their head pops off the pillow thinking of new ways to hurt people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here yeah, we are like I'm going to get them today. And they call that ministry. Mm -hmm. And then they call that kind of preaching, you know, evangelical. Biblical. And I'm like, what's that? It and when that's, when that's going on, that this talk about trust that we had right here toward the beginning of this one, it, you know, is you never get to that conversation, much less oh, experience yeah. what it's like and how it affects the way you think and feel. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was watching a documentary. Uh, I didn't plan to talk about this, but I was watching a documentary and they were talking about, uh, a couple of scientists were talking about the fact that for example, in chimpanzee society, there's an alpha male. And the alpha male is uh, brutal and he does what he wants. Mm -hmm. And there's nobody to police him and nobody will confront him. And he can rape at will and he can kill at will. He's an alpha male. And, um, and so what's the, what's the difference between an alpha male chimp and a human male? Why don't we go around acting? We're the alpha male humans. And the theory is, is that when we learn the language, the development of language to talk to one another, 
and to reason with one another that um, that may have been the thing that made it possible for us to instead of have alpha and alpha male is to work as collect, uh, collectively as equals, to compete less and to set it up so that we protect one another. And that if, if an alpha male does something bad, we do, we do bad right back to them to, def, to deter them from the bad. And that's what our judicial system does. And it's all based on the ability for humans to reason and use language. And, um, but if you don't have the ability to say anything, to have you know, any meaningful communication, who's gonna come to your help? Who's gonna come to your help if you're a chimp and, and you're not the alpha male? He can do it to you. He can do to you what he wants to. You should be terrified of him. Yeah. Of course, now there are people in our culture who act like alpha males, but for the most part, you know, they get caught and they get thrown in jail for a while. Mm -hmm. But, um, but our culture, our culture also makes it possible because we've become civilized. It makes it possible for people to become sort of, I don't know what to call it, um, faux, it's not, they're alpha males, they're, they're alpha males that don't, um, you know, are, that aren't mur have murderous intent. They're alpha males who have more subtle ways of destroying people's lives mm -hmm. and getting what they want. Yeah. And there are too many of them in our pulpits. Mm -hmm. They're predators. Yeah. Bullies. These are these alpha. are alpha males who who act civilized enough, mm -hmm. domesticated enough that they don't appear to be dangerous. Yeah. But if your head pops off the pillow every morning thinking of ever more cruel ways <laughs> to hurt everybody on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. and you just can't wait to do it. You're, a, you're you're an alpha male chump. You're a bully. Yeah. You're an abuser. Yeah. I don't know. I'm checking. I, I can't even tell when I'm on Facebook. Uh, yes, Paul is here. Um, hey, I can't see behind the photos, but I see Paula down at the bottom. Why did your screen go blind? Okay, good. Well, I had to pull. I'm sh I'm screen sharing, so I had to pull my okay. Facebook up. Yeah, I'm sorry I went on a little rant there, but um, you know, there's a lot of rewards for men who are. Um, type A personalities as opposed to type B, more extroverted than introverted, more athletic than intellectual. There are a lot of uh, advantages still um, in mate selection and, and other things, um, success in the world, attractiveness, height, all of those things do give you some advantage. But one thing that our, our being able to talk has created is the ability to agree on systems that keep alpha males to a certain degree, to a large degree, at least in our country, from uh, just running them up. Um, uh, although I will say this, Antifa is a good example of, of people who decided, you know what, we're, we're gonna go, we're just gonna do, do what we want. If there's, a if there's trouble somewhere, we're gonna go there and make more trouble. We're going to break stuff. We're going to burn this mother down. We're going to get what we're going to pick. We're going to loot. We're going to get our stuff. And the large majority of them are white. And they go, they go around wherever Black Lives Matter is having a protest. And they go and, and, and just run amok. And, and they're still doing it. It's just not on the news as much. And it's still going on. And so when I see teenagers acting out, I'm, a, I'm aware, I'm reminded of that uh, story about the elephant shawl. Have you heard the one about 
They took the male elephants out of a herd because it was over, they were over reproducing. There were too many of them and they were destroying all the trees. And so they thought if they took some of the, the bulls out that the, the, there would be as many of them to, you know, reproduce with the females so that the, it would curb the population. Um, but guess what? All of the teenage young male uh, <laughs> elephants turned into those alpha male chimps and started going around and raping all the women and girls, ele elephants. And um, they said, we've made a terrible mistake. And they put the bulls back in. And just like that, I mean, it didn't take one day. Just like that, they had those teenage males walking around holding on to the tails of those bulls, just following around all day long. Just, you just hang on to my tail. You walk on wherever I go, you go. If you let go of my tail, I'm going to whop you. You know, mm -hmm. it, they had someone to civilize them. Yeah. They had someone to give them um, the guidance they needed at a young age so that they don't become an animal. Mm -hmm. But what we have in our pulpits in these indoctrinated churches are wolves. They're sneaky and they, are, and they aren't the kind of wolves that often murder or rape, but though that does happen, um, they're the kind of wolves who in sheep's clothing yeah. will take advantage of people that they hate and pretend to be a pastor mm -hmm. to make money. Sad. Yeah, and so indoctrination can't help happen without our help. And when we help those who indoctr are indoctrinated, when we help and it an abuser, indoctrinate other people into the church or the cult or whatever it is that we're in. See, that getting over the guilt of having done that is probably one of the biggest wounds for some people. You know, I facilitate, so, what if you facilitated? But sometimes you don't know you're being indoctrinated. That's, that's you know, that's, that's but what I'm saying is when you're indoctrinating <laughs> other people, like when you preach the way you used to preach, mm -hmm. you are indoctrinating people to your, to your own church where this was going on, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about the forgiveness that has to happen that you would do that to people. Yeah. You thought you were doing the right thing at the time, but looking back, maybe not so much so. I wonder what happened. But we are still on, right? I can't, yeah, I can't, I can't hear Patricia very well now though. She, she suddenly was talking softly. Uh, I was saying we missed, we lost Jean. She was uh, talking to me privately. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, we lost Jean. I don't know, I, but he was having problems earlier with his Zoom, but on the other hand, he may have had to go to some place. Yeah, about. Doesn't yeah, he have he quiet? Right at 7.30, I think. Yeah, okay. Well, um, uh, Questions to continue thinking about. Oh, by the way, I've made I made a video. It's not ready yet, um, but it's of a um, praise band at a cult, or at least what's called online a cult. And it's when I saw this praise band, I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a, what would, what a praise band would look like if Joe Walsh of the Eagles would put on a suit and uh, create uh, a sort of semi-Eagles type band. But instead of being kind of loose and hippie-like, they all look like Mormons. <laughs> you know, kind of tall, white, and, <laughs> and you know, proper. And, and proper and having, this, having a Jesus smile on their face at all times, you know? And, <laughs> And, and it was the most, it was the most, and they were, and they were ripping off every song from the eighties. I mean, it sounded just like some Joe Wall songs and Elvis and, and, and my brain went crazy. Mm -hmm. And it, it so flipped my brain. It's just a four minute thing, but I've been working on it all week. I mean, the, I, it may be the most theologically profound thing I've ever put together, but I, I'm going to get burned on YouTube. I'm afraid to send it in because I know I'm going to get burned and, I may just have to send it around by email because I don't think they're going to let it on YouTube. I'm going to try eventually, but maybe next week. We'll see. We'll see. 
four minute song that will blow your mind what I did to it. I don't know, maybe I should show the original first and then show the one that I did. Cause they're only four minutes each. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's amazing to me that the songs that he ripped off or at least unconsciously used to write his own song have words that are so antithetical to the way he was presenting himself. And, and it reminded me very much of the human condition. Yeah, and indo as indoctrination does too. Y'all, um, any other comments tonight, please, before we roll? I have one just as really quick, Bert, you just reminded me of something. I was watching this special about um, cults and the cultivation of cults and how they got started and things like that and one of the one of the followers started speaking on how her particular group and what you just spoke on just kind of reminded me of it how her particular group they would go in and actually mass produce records the records were all christian songs with hidden subliminal messages in there related to satanic worship. And they oh knew Lord. the best way to get more people was through Christian music. Mm. Yeah, so it just makes that. you makes you kind of realize to be careful what you bring into your spirit, mm -hmm. even knowing that, okay, it's labeled as Christian, but is it? Yeah, how do you know, how does a, a song can't be a Christian? It's no, exactly. okay? <laughs> so, but the word, the meaning of the words, if they are not theologically accurate or biblically sound, um, it, and the other thing is that it often doesn't sound dangerous to me. It just sounds like, it just sounds so repetitive and boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think I know what, I, I don't know if you were talking about this, um, Kia, but years ago too, I've heard of how you can, if you play back certain musics, you can hear a lot about, you know, satanic um, um, words and lyrics and music, and they flip it on a way, you know, it sounds like it's maybe Christian or gospel I've heard music. rumors of that in the 60s with yeah. the Beatles, for example. Yeah. But I know another story that kind of shoots that down, right? and that's just people, just people talking. But um, the thing is, is that uh, Frank Zappa, for example, uh, wanted to use profanity in his songs, but his record label um, kept insisting that he couldn't do that. Well, he recorded a song that had a really bad word in it. And you know what they did, just despite him? They took that verse and they reversed it on the tape and played it double speed. So it's on the record. So they didn't break their contract, but it's not listenable to unless you turn it backwards really fast. Mm -hmm. And then you can hear the cuss word that Frank said. Sometimes it's just, it's not, it's not Satan. It, it's record company executives, yeah. you know, who are, who are in a battle with, you know, rich and famous musicians. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, the whole, that whole satanic thing, it sounds, it sounds, yeah, just for, just from me to y'all, BS. Okay. This is for me to y'all. I, you know, it, it. Those people are dangerous only because they're kind of half crazy. You don't know what they're gonna do. Mm -hmm. They like attention and they do weird stuff. And sometimes it can get and get weirder and weirder till they're killing cats. You know. Yeah, but that's what Jeffrey Dahmer did before he kill, killed his neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm healing from my anger and resentment of the people who I watched all around me as indoctrinated people hurt others in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. on purpose mm -hmm. and didn't see anything wrong with or any hypocritical about it. it I'm so still, I still, I still try to treat everybody the same. I try to give people respect no matter who they are. And I find myself, I find that evangelicals tend to like me a lot. On the other hand, I 
<laughs> Once they hear me talk, they don't know what what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. Um, anybody else, please? I see Sheila, Mike here, Gina's Dawn. Anybody on Facebook? Ms. Paula. Um, we have lurkers, though. See our lurkers? Well, y'all have a great evening, and uh, I'm going to close this recording. I apologize. I'm a little bit sleepy tonight, but um, I'm excited about that project, my little four-minute video, and I'll share it as soon as I can. If, if YouTube won't have it, because it's got original segments from original songs on it, um, I can't explain it better than that. I mean, I don't just stop and play the Beatles or something. I've incorporated the songs that this guy ripped off into his own recording. Mm -hmm. So it sounds even more like what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you wanted your song to sound a little like Joe Walsh? Okay, well, here, I got Joe Walsh. I'll just line it right up, change the tempo with my machinery, change the pitch with it, and line you two guys up and put it in there. The result is staggering. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, and the theological clash between what he was singing in the song about putting God first, mm -hmm. and uh, Van Halen in the background sing singing "Running with the Devil," <laughs> and it's the same song. All right. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> you 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 won't believe it. You won't believe what you hear. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. Um, okay, well, I will hopefully see you all uh, back around, maybe on Sunday if you can, uh, for, for worship. Uh, oh, I won't be there. And Gene's out next week, right? And Gene's out next, next, Wednesday. Wednesday. next Wednesday. Yeah, this is going to be weird. I'm, I'm not preaching this Sunday, and and um, yeah. and Gina won't be around because of the Renaissance Fair next Wednesday. But we'll keep you posted on what who's doing what. And by the way, I sometimes walk past this equipment and just feel like sometimes just turning it on and seeing who shows up. Do it. I just might do that. Yeah. I just go live on Facebook and say, hey, everybody. <laughs> Nobody will come. <laughs> well, no, until quiet. well, we'll try. All right. Blessings, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Mike, and Sheila, especially Kia. Bye. And all, as always, Patricia and, and Gino, and, and we know where Dale is, right? Everybody knows he's over yeah. in the Holy Land right now. I believe he's um, at the Holy Land um, Hotel in Jerusalem, I believe, which surprised me because normally they stay in Bethlehem, but whatever. Blessings, everybody. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Okay. Good night. Good night, Patricia. Good night, Mike. What's that just squeezing? That's the dog's toy. Oh. <laughs> it's the bunny. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye, y'all. Take care. You too.